We are super proud to announce that Stay Plugged In is now sponsored by HyperX for our online events for the month of August. Prizes will include a Cloud Stinger wireless headset and a Cloud Stinger wired headset for our Turbo Tuesday tournaments for the first and second winning teams. And then for our Valorant tournaments, which are every other week on Thursdays and Fridays, that will be the Alloy Origins Core Mechanical Gaming Keyboard, HX Red, and the Pulsefire FPS Pro Gaming Mouse, which the keyboard is for first place and the mouse is for second place. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of SpinCast. We're diving back into the world of collegiate esports. Um, joining us today is Kenny, aka Beanies, um, commonly known as his gamer tag online. So without further ado, Beanies, go ahead, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your past, where your passions in esports started, and in Overwatch particularly, since that's where most of your work's been. Um, and kind of mm -hmm. tell us where it began and then how that took you to where you are now. Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, I'm Kenny Beanies. You can call me whichever you want. I am officially the, the former manager for Rutgers Overwatch. I ran the team there for three years and some change. I want to say three years and what March till now is like four months. So yeah, like three years and four or five months spent some time there. And yeah, as you said, Overwatch is where it's done. I've done most of my work and I've done team management in Overwatch. And I've also done broadcast commentary in Overwatch and a few other games, uh, Apex Legends, Fortnite, um, Call of Duty, both Black Ops 4 and the new One Modern Warfare. So I like to dip my foot in whatever esport I can get to. Usually they end up being first person shooters, but you know, I spread the love where I can to the MOBAs of, of the world. Oh, Valorant. I forgot that, but that's the most recent one I've touched. And I guess like it all got, I mean, I've always loved gaming. I've gamed my whole life. Um, I think my first system was like a, I think it was like a Game Boy Color, like a Sega Dreamcast way back when playing like a 1997 made Power Rangers game starting young. And then um, fast forward a few years to high school. My first esport I get into really is League of Legends, where I dive deep into League of Legends. I remember distinctly coming in just before they started their first, uh, I guess, traditional season format, where they ran a uh, spring and a summer split. And that kind of blew my mind as a junior in high school that they were able to do that in esports. And that was really when I first got into the whole atmosphere of it and joining the community as a whole. And then fast forward again junior year of college i get assigned a project in one of my classes to call them a passion project where basically pursue a passion of yours get involved do a midterm presentation on it for half of your semester grade no big deal and we it's very it's a very vague general kind of project and essentially i chose esports took one step through interviewing some members of rutgers esports one thing led to another they offered me the spot running the team and here we are today yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, that's kind of the common theme in esports is taking that passion and figuring out how to, you know, work in it, how to get an internship, how to get an opportunity working in that industry, um, yeah. which we all want to do. And then also, you know, looking forward, trying to expand the industry as well in our little corner um, as much as we can. So kind of diving right into it. Um, I'm interested to hear more about the team management side. Like a lot of the audience is high schoolers and their parents um, really trying to figure out what collegiate esports looks like from within the program. So talk us through your role as a team manager and the support you give the team and, you know, how that really helps those players stay at their peak performance without having to worry about all the responsibilities that you have. Yeah. So essentially I called myself the team mom when I was running the show. Uh, I would handle everything outside of the game that didn't pertain to Overwatch, essentially. I mean, the players only need to focus on one thing and that's improving at the game and winning. And so my job basically would be, as I said, dealing with everything outside the game. I would handle getting practices for the team, finding tournaments, dealing with tournament admins, dealing with either school administration or the Rutgers eSports organization itself because uh, it's still a student-run organization. Um, I would also handle any travel plans if we had to travel anywhere. So one thing comes to mind last year, we had to go to Houston for the – uh, TESPA collegiate nationals that ESPN put on and the whole month leading up to that was just nonstop talking with the uh, representative from ESPN dealing with all that show and it was uh, that was my first time not 
uh, I guess buying tickets or travel, doing traveling plans for anyone outside of myself, you know, flying. And so it was a real experience working with a travel agency and all that stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, unfortunately, one of the jobs that I, I should have is working with administration. But since Rutgers esports is still student run, they're still kind of like a gray area where Rutgers administration is kind of toying with, you know, letting us in. They just finished building a land center for uh, Rutgers esports that's being run by a staff member. So now there is staff member affiliation with the organization, but that still lends it to a gray area where unfortunately I wasn't able to hand out any scholarships to anyone like that. So all the players who participated on the team were people who came to Rutgers and then had a passion for Overwatch as well. And so a lot of that meant that these players were students first and uh, athletes second. Mm -hmm. and so that means, you know, these players, they play for scholarship money that they get from tournament winning. So it's a lot more important to them to perform at these levels, whereas some schools are afforded the ability to give their students scholarships. And I can only hope that Rutgers is on that traje trajectory because I mean, if you look at the ecosystem of college esports right now, a lot of smaller schools are hopping on that train of uh, giving scholarships to their players and whatnot. And they're really seeing a lot of growth come in, not only from the esports side, but that that brings in more students, that brings in more interest in your university. And that's really, I mean, Rutgers doesn't have to deal with that, but mm -hmm. that's where they should be going. Yeah, absolutely. I always love to see that trajectory that you're talking about of, you know, taking these larger schools, right? Rutgers is pretty big nationally known into that space of like the varsity kind of program, right? Where it's yeah. dedicated support, you know, there's money being funded, it's funded monetarily. Um, and those finances really help, you know, develop the program. Um, and without it, when it's student run, you know, then fundraising is all on them, you know, fund everything really is all on them. Um, and that makes it more difficult to be able to grow as a team and compete at higher exactly. Um, so kind of my next question is, um, we talked to it a little bit just then in my response and your response. Um, what does the dedicated support from the university in your experience really kind of enable, right? So I know there's a lot of schools out there that do have that dedicated support and a lot that don't. Um, so kind of what do you think is the most important part of what that support really looks like um, and enables for the students in the program itself? So I think first and foremost, um, a practice facility is very important. Having that area where people can converge in one location and work as a team makes a very big difference compared to having a Discord meeting and you're looking at your coach's uh, shared screen as he goes over reviews of plays and whatnot. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have access to the land center. We still don't have access to the land center, I guess, technically, even though it was finished. I think back in April, you know, obvious circumstances means that nobody's been able to go in there and whatnot. Um, but yeah, one of the big things about really dealing with the um, situation is just, I guess you want having players in the same location is it gives them an opportunity to not only put faces to names and whatnot, but the discussions and the, the way you're able to grow as a team is a lot more noticeable than when you're stuck doing it online. Um, for example, one of our players this year went to the Camden campus of Rutgers. Rutgers has three campuses, New Brunswick, which is the main one most of you know if you know Rutgers. Then there's Newark, which is uh, smaller than New Brunswick, and then there's Camden, which is the smallest of the three. Camden feels like a much smaller, from my experience, like a small, tiny liberal, liberal arts college. And we had one of our players going to the Camden campus, so we weren't afforded many opportunities to meet in person. And when we did, you could really see the difference it made in the team. I mean, the traveling together, going to tournaments, staying in hotels, all those experiences, they were just little glimpses of what it could be like when you're actually able to have, as I said, a land center where people can practice together. You can see the person you're playing with face-to-face, -face, turn around after a game, go to a whiteboard, write down things teammates need to do go to the VOD review right, right away with your coach just like that and start going it over it really makes a big difference and I think that is one thing that uh, that universities really could be doing to help their esports programs develop into something fantastic yeah absolutely and something that right along that point um, of having that land presence that physical plant presence where you're practicing next to your teammates not in the same discord call you know how many miles apart or whatever um, mm -hmm you know, really focusing on that, the collegiate level, and then what we kind of look at um, within State Plugged into the youth, the, 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 
can't speak today, the youth level as well, where you're, you're starting these traditions a lot younger, right? Because you see in traditional sports, all the teamwork, the communications, you know, work ethic, ambition, desire, how to be a good teammate is yeah. really easy to develop at a younger age. But people that pursue esports, you know, often or not, don't play as much of the traditional sports at a younger age. And you start to lose out at that. And then, you know, if you don't have that land presence until college, you know, that starts a little bit of some issues that hopefully we can start mitigating in the future. But I love yeah. to see that land presence at the collegiate level because it gives those opportunities that you said to grow as a team um, and really be on that same page when you're striving for success. Um, way earlier, shifting gears a little bit, you talked about casting. Um, and that's another facet of esports. A lot of people overlook mm -hmm. the production, the behind the scenes side um, type of stuff. So, yeah. you know, you said you casted for a number of those FPS titles. Um, kind of talk us through what the differences are in casting versus team management. There's pretty obvious ones there, but then also casting um, and even I'm not sure if you have, but team management amongst different titles and kind of what goes into everything when the games change. So uh, I did dip my toe in Valorant a bit. We had, uh, as a team manager, we had a very short window where NYXL and Box announced that they were doing a Valorant tournament. They announced it on like, I want to say like a Sunday. No, they may have announced it on like a, a Saturday or a Sunday. And then by that Wednesday, we had a tryout form out. And then by Saturday, we did tryouts. Sunday, we had two teams together. And then that Monday, the first round of the tournament started. So it was all very, you know, mm -hmm. just hit the ground running, do, do what you can do with these four other guys and girls you just met. Um, so that was really my only experience outside of managing something other than Overwatch. But in terms of other things, it's like with the casting, I mean, the difference is like, I don't, okay, I've casted a few of our Rutgers games, but for the most part, I don't have any bias or any, investment in most games i'm casting mm -hmm. um and the few games i have had to cast for Rutgers, i've had to maintain an unbiased point of view for most of it there's one that it was like an, a land reverse sweep to win a grand finals for the first spring rally and i couldn't contain myself like i bias was very obvious at, in that fifth map when we won and mm -hmm. i have no shame about it but mm -hmm. aside from that um as a manager i can distinctly remember at the nationals in 2018 down in houston sitting backstage with our coach and the coaches from uh the coach and manager for utah the team we were playing and we're good friends with them and just sitting there and like the the powerlessness you have where you're just watching on this screen and all this all these hours of practice and preparation you've put in and you're just sitting there watching and as a manager there's nothing I can do. I mean, the coach is going to talk to them. I'm going to sit there, I'll get them water, but my entire job is has been done for, you know, days on end by now. You know, most of my job at this point is just, I have a schedule. Players have to be here, here, and here by then. Make it happen. You know, other than that, I'm just walking around and the players really control the show. And when you're casting an event, it's very different. When you're casting, you know, you're, you got to be prepared. You got to be on top of things. All you, like, all of your job for casting is happening on the day of the event. You can prepare a bit you know, get to know the teams you're talking about and whatnot. And if you need to familiarize, so familiarize yourself with the title, do that. But for the most part, everything you're doing is day of. And as a manager, everything I did was leading up to day of. So very different worlds, very different times of, you know, stress and having to do, get work done and whatnot. So for the most part, very, very yin and yang, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I always, I love to see that, you know, really showing how much prep work goes into that team management of, you know, there's so much to do before that event starts and so much yeah. work that you have to accomplish to even make sure the players are there on time, that travel is good, that they're in the right tournament, all registered and everything, which is so massive. And it takes that burden off the players' shoulders so much, which is fantastic to see. Kind of as my last question here, as we start to wrap up before we run out of time, yeah. looking towards the future, right? We talked a lot about collegiate esports and the team management and then also the university support kind of sides. Um, looking towards the future, what do you want to see change or improve or grow um, within the collegiate esports scene to really bring it to that next level? Whether it's, you know, maybe a hot topic surrounding it's the NCAA involvement or conference involvement. What, what does that look like to you in that successful type? Uh, what do you think would really help expand collegiate esports to that next level? Well, I think a person, so a personal thing I've always wanted improved is 
the sense of commitment, I guess, to competing in esports. You compare how esports is right now to any other college sport. You have rosters of players, they join that roster, and for the most part, you know, extenuating circumstances aside, they're going to be there for the whole season. They're committed to it. They're going to be doing all the things that they have to be doing. In esports, because it's a lot more, I don't want to say lackadaisical, but it's a lot more, a lot, it has a lot less boundaries to it and a lot less rigid where people can come and go from a roster so easily or so someone can go from player to coach because they lose interest in the game and whatnot. And it's, you know, it's an, it's different from what we're all used to those of us uh, into the world of traditional sports. And it's something that I think just needs to, that that'll come with, as you mentioned in the question, you know, with more structured support and more, uh, administration support because once you have these schools that are investing money in the players they're going to expect some some something on the something re, what's the thing i'm looking for return investment god yeah. um, being a languager is so hard oh <laughs> and um but we it's really up to the play once the universities present that money the players really have to put their best foot forward i mean if you're going to be a, someone who's going to be given a scholarship to play uh, main tank for an entire year flex dps for an entire year then i mean uh, you know unless there's something that happens within the team you need to change some things around for the most part you're expected to do that for the entire term that you're being paid out for and some players i mean may not be able to do that if it's it's not as prevalent i've noticed that the top tier of overwatch in college and i can only speak on overwatch you know rainbow six csgo league of legends i can't speak too much on them but Overwatch, it's not really prevalent at the top tier because you have a lot of these players that are extremely good at the game and see themselves having a reasonable chance at winning it and they want to do it. And also you're limited on the amount of high skill players that you have at your university. You know, fortunately over my years, my, uh, I think between the three and some odd years I've been here, I've had 22, 20, I think, or 22 players come through and play on our division one team. And that's at a school with, 35 40,000 people annual like annually so if you're thinking of these universities that are high schools how are they going to be able to hold on to these top tier players and you know when you don't have that money available a lot of these lesser known schools are going to have a lot more of a difficult time of creating that first big team mm -hmm. you know Rutgers Overwatch the first Rutgers Overwatch team was one of the top teams in the nation and then the first fall season before I even joined the team the roster they went to the first TESPA collegiate nationals at, at a LAN. And that really puts you on the map. And from there, Rutgers really just had its name stamp, stamped next to Overwatch. But if you're a smaller school and you don't have the opportunity afforded by 40,000 students, how are you going to legitimize yourself in the eyes of your university? You know, how, how can you do that if you don't have players committed throughout the entire year working with the team? Or how do you do that if you don't have that one or that, I mean, in the case of Overwatch, you can't even depend on one player. You need a full roster of top tier talent to s compete in the collegiate ecosystem. So mm -hmm. really, I, like I said, it's, I want to see more commitment from players and more strict um, guidelines and rigid rules with how players function and, you know, coaching and players and whatnot and more legitimacy. But I guess ultimately that does come from administration willing to invest mm -hmm. that money in it. Because without that money and without that university support, in the players' heads, it's like, you know, why am I representing this university? They don't invest anything in me. What should I be giving back to them? And, mm -hmm. and the like. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think at the core of that's that lack of structure, right? There's a very rigid structure that the NCAA kind of employs for football, baseball, basketball, and many other competitions. And I don't know if NCAA is the answer, but that structure is, right? So the expectations are there. You know the support you're getting from your university. You know the commitments that you're giving to your team, that team is giving to you. Um, and also the team management, the support staff, the coaches, and on and on and on. Having that structure that's expected and known before you go in kind of sets that stage for that overarching commitment. Yeah, and uh, you know, to that, one of the conferences I should shout out that's been working with esports a lot is the MAC, the Mid Athletic, mm -hmm. Mid Atlantic Athletic Conference. I always screw mm -hmm. those double A's up, mm -hmm. but I've casted for them, and they, the when I, or excuse me, before we were went live we were talking about right before covid hit i had a casting gig i was supposed to go to down atlantic city and it was for egf the electronic gaming federation and the mac championships mm -hmm. and so mac is really 
when I think of college conferences, I think of Mac and I think of Big Ten, the two that really have put their best foot forward in esports. You know, Big Ten has been supporting League of Legends. I know Rutgers League of Legends has been competing in the Big Ten League for, I want to say, three years at, at minimum, three years. And then mm-hmm. Mac gives these team these players not only the opportunity to compete in a structured league throughout the semester but a land finals they have a chance to really win some money some scholarship prizing and a lot of these schools aren't your the ones you're seeing that i mentioned before in the top tiers of tespa competition you know in the mac you don't have an asu you don't have a maryville a utah a harrisburg a rutgers a northeastern you know these schools aren't in the mac conference for you know overwatch titles so when they're competing that's exactly what i'm talking about where schools with smaller student bases need the opportunity to legitimize their own esports programs Mm -hmm. and the mac is doing just that because for example when i um when i commentated them last year for 2019 it was up in albany and i'm just thinking of i think stockton university their Fortnite team for example won the uh championship there last year i believe and if if they didn't, they got very close. And that and Stockton's not a very big school. Stockton's down South Jersey, very small university. And so having that win is massive for them because that you take that to administration, you show them there's promise. Then they think, all right, maybe we can see some return on investment here. Then the wheels get rolling. Next thing you know, Stockton has a may have a full fledged program going in the future. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what needs to happen to really spark that snowball-esque movement, that avalanche that will bring esports to the forefront of collegiate competitions, right? Make it mainstream. You see it on ESPN, you see it on ABC, NBC, these massive media platforms um, to really give it that validity for that public eye, right? Which it doesn't quite have. Uh, But unfortunately, we are out of time. I think we've had a fantastic conversation and really expanding the light in collegiate esports and that future growth that's possible and it's very prevalent. Um, people just need to do it and get the, uh, that get collegiate esports to the next level. So exactly. real quick, um, Kenny, aka Beanies, uh, plug yourself, um, plug whoever you want, um, whether it's Wreckers or any other team. Um, if we want to know a little bit more about you or them, yeah. So all my socials, I'm at Beanies Ent. Think of like Blizzard Ent, but I'm a person, not a corporate entity. Mm-hmm. And then um, I guess uh, yeah, Rutgers Esports. Even though I did just leave there you know my heart still lies in new brunswick go hit them up with a follow at Rutgers esports on all their socials as well it's good to stay updated and then um in general i know at least for overwatch there's something called the collegiate hub it's a discord it's a twitter if you're interested in anything collegiate specifically overwatch go check them out it's uh at the i think it's at the collegiate hub on twitter not too sure but definitely give them a, a look if you're interested in dabbling in uh, or dipping your toes in college esports. Absolutely. Everyone out there, thanks for staying the whole time. Go follow Kenny, go follow those other associations to really stay up to date in everything Collegiate Overwatch. To everyone out there, stay healthy and stay happy in the current pandemic. Uh, make sure you're taking care of your loved ones. Um, stay safe out there. And ultimately, stay plugged in. Mm-hmm.